Nine of the top 10 killers of people are related to metabolism. That is key because this is not just a conversation for people in their 50s. This is a conversation for people in their 30s. I would say we're in a crisis right now. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Dr. Sarah Gottfried, welcome to the Commune Podcast. Thank you, Jeff. So happy to be here. Yes, you've been now uh, at Commune Topanga for six days or so. And um, I will say that you fit right in. <laughs> I am so honored. <laughs> I'm so honored. I tried to fit in. I love it here. Um, yeah, I think when I saw you first, you had uh, the bandana and maybe the <laughs> cheetah print leggings. I sure did. And, uh, you know, kind of some spiritual gangster style crop or something going on. And I was like, and the shades. And I was like, Sarah belongs in Topanga. You know, you are a keen observer of humans. I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, I've been trained um, <laughs> to say nothing. <laughs> Um, and we, you know, we have uh, a good amount in common there. We, uh, I tend to be uh, shooting X's, um, X chromosomes, that is. And so I have three daughters, and, and you have daughters, and they are of similar age. Yes. Um, so we are both confronting um, transitions in our personal lives, seeing our progeny um, become their best selves in the world, get the best of them in, in, in every possible good good way. Uh, mine, as you know, leaves tomorrow for, uh, for, uh, for France for a year. Yes, so, so exciting. Yeah. It's true. You and I both have this juxtaposition of puberty and some of the challenges of puberty through the teenage years together with a little perimenopause in the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Skylar, my wife, um, is 52 and is sort of mid-menopause. And then, of course, I have three teenage daughters who are brimming <laughs> with hormones. Um, and hopefully we can untangle uh, some of that over our time together. Um, you know, I, I often think that there are two questions that have dogged humanity for time immemorial. Um, so one is, why are we here? Mm. And the other one is, well, what should we put in our mouth, you know, mm. day to day? Yes. I'm not sure how much progress we'll make on the former, <laughs> but maybe we'll make some, some progress on the latter um, because, you know, you've done so much uh, incredible work around um, nutrition, around nutrition optimized for metabolism uh, specifically, and nutrition and its relationship to hormones. Um, and so there's a l so much there. In fact, uh, the, the greatest difficulty I had in the preparation for this interview was pretty much not to, t uh, not to what to talk about because I have some copious notes here. Um, but maybe we could start... Um, with you unpacking a little bit of the problem, uh, because I've heard you talk about 88% um, of our population in the United States, but this is characteristic of the Western world in general, uh, is metabolically dysfunctional or has cardiometabolic dysfunction. That's right. And I wonder if you could unpack what metabolic dysfunction means and what are some of its primary causes? We have to start first with the definition of metabolism. Because yeah. I think a lot of folks don't understand how broad and how deep it is. So metabolism is really the sum total of all of the biochemical reactions that are happening in the body that relate to your energy. So whether you're going to use food as an example as fuel, or if you're going to store that energy for another day, store it as fat. So metabolism is this really important process. I would say there's a myth that metabolism is about how fast or slow you burn calories. And I want people to think about metabolism much more broadly. So metabolic dysfunction, I would say we're in a crisis right now 
So we know that Americans certainly are getting worse and worse when it comes to metabolic function. We can get into the details of how you measure that. But the idea with metabolic dysfunction is that you're no longer able to take that apple that you eat or the kale salad and translate it into the kind of fuel that your cells need. Mm -hmm. So metabolic dysfunction can be measured in a lot of ways. This 88% statistic refers to a study from the University of North Carolina where they found that 88% of Americans have at least one of the criteria for metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. So that relates to fasting glucose, it relates to your blood pressure, it's a, a measure of triglycerides. There's kind of this old school way of measuring metabolism. And then I would say there's a new school way of measuring metabolism that I think is much more comprehensive and gives us a lot more information. Okay, well now you have to <laughs> divulge what that is. Well, you know, the, the gold standard for measuring your metabolic health is to do a fasting glucose. Mm -hmm. So that's your glucose first thing in the morning. We're told by conventional medicine that it should be between 70 and 99. That is classified as normal glycemia, normal glucose levels. Mm -hmm. If your level's above that, 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter, that's classified as prediabetes. And then above that 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher is diabetes when it's measured on a couple of instances, and then you want to do some additional testing. So that's one of the old school measures. The problem is most people are getting that measured maybe once a year, yeah. maybe every two years, especially during the pandemic. There's another measure too, hemoglobin A1C. So we've got a similar set of criteria for normal prediabetes and diabetes. We also do two-hour glucose challenge tests. That's a more dynamic way of looking at how you're responding to glucose. But the truth is, what I find in my practice and what I found myself, and I think you found too, is that often you have these excursions, these changes in your blood sugar that are not showing up at your doctor's office with your fasting glucose and your hemoglobin A1C, but you can see it when you're wearing a continuous glucose monitor. Yeah, absolutely. So if you can actually make it to your annual visit, what you're generally getting is a snapshot in time or with hemoglobin A1C, I think that that's an average of your blood glucose over a three-month period. But it's not giving you real good data moment to moment. Like how are you responding to the food and the nutrients that you eat? Um, and so as we've talked about a, a number of times prior to this recording, you know, we both wear continuous glucose monitors and, um, and I think, you know, maybe talking a little bit about our own personal experience could ground this conversation, um, for a lot of people, because honestly, I was under the impression that I was a relatively healthy person. Now, I was working really hard. I was raising a family. I have three daughters, as Apper mentioned. <laughs> There's I'll, a lot I'll, of estrogen. I'll, I'll keep bringing that up. Um, and, uh, and, you know, sometimes I'm working late into the night. Oh, uh, yeah, did I love and savor my one glass of Cabernet? All of these things. But I was exercising pretty much every day. I was under the impression that I was eating a relatively healthy diet. But then I started to wear a continuous glucose monitor. And lo and behold, I started to measure my blood glucose day by day. And to be honest, at the, at the beginning, a little neurotically moment by moment. And I realized that I was running pre-diabetic levels. So I was running very regularly 120, uh, 110 milligrams per deciliter, uh, and then seeing significant spikes postprandial, so after eating, uh, and then some other spikes associated with um, with high intensity exercise and sauna, which maybe we can unpack at some point. Um, but the after I started wearing this device, it's like a dashboard on your car. And in retrospect, I can't believe that I never had it before because it gives you data into your own personal vehicle such that you can modify your protocols to optimize your health. So, uh, you know, since wearing it, 
now I've dropped into I, that normal range on the on the bottom side of that normal range. Uh, mostly my fasting glucose is in the 70s. And then when it when it spikes after meals, which is normal, it's spiking in the low 100s, but it's kind of these like nice little waves. It's nothing, you know, They're huge, like bunny like slopes. Bunny slopes. Not, you know, double diamonds. Which is about what I can handle at this, <laughs> at this point. Um, so w- is that a common experience? And what was the experience for you when you started to look at your blood glucose levels on a more consistent basis. What you're describing is such a common experience. And you know what you get told by conventional mainstream physicians is that you don't need to use a continuous glucose monitor if you're not a diabetic. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, I feel like it is a tool that allows you to personalize your diet and lifestyle in a way that gives you real-time feedback and really allows you to make changes and habits that stick. So I love tools that empower people in this way. My experience was very similar to yours. So I started a little bit earlier in the sense that I was checking my glucose and my insulin back in my 30s. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day that I went and saw my primary care doctor, I was feeling overwhelmed and stressed. I was working in McMedicine. I was seeing about 40 patients a day. And I just felt too young to feel so old. Yeah. And... I told him about, you know, how I was struggling with weight gain. I had gained weight after my first baby, couldn't lose it. I was struggling with premenstrual syndrome and overwhelm. And he offered me an antidepressant and he told me to exercise more and eat less. So I left his office and I went to the lab. And at that time, I wasn't aware of CGMs, but I checked my fasting glucose and my fasting insulin And my glucose was the same as yours, so 110, 105. Mm -hmm. So I did some things to correct it at that time to become more insulin sensitive as opposed to insulin resistant. Might be worth just a moment um, talking about this. So insulin, I think of as a bouncer outside of a club. And it determines how much glucose to let inside the cell or inside the club. If your bouncer's not working well, What can happen is that the glucose is building up in your bloodstream. So glucose is climbing maybe to the prediabetes level like you and I experienced, and it's causing all kinds of problems in the street because it's not getting into the club. So we want to have a really good bouncer. We want insulin to be working on our side, not working against us. What happens with most of us if we get too many refined carbohydrates or, you know, we have a standard American diet or we are more sedentary, or we've got a lot of stress or even trauma, we know that all of those things can be associated with the bouncer not working. Also, you could think of that as insulin resistance, where your cells become numb to insulin. Mm -hmm. So that was me in my 30s. So I knew I had a problem. I started to address it, but it wasn't until four years ago that I got the continuous glucose monitor that I realized, oh my gosh, I've got a serious problem here. So I found, for instance, that a lot of the foods that I was eating, I was following mostly a paleo diet at that time. I found that sweet potatoes were spiking my glucose. I found that some of the fruits that I was eating were spiking me. I found that um, really potatoes of any type were a problem for me. I even found that some of the smoothies I was making with berries and even with some fat were not sufficient to stabilize my blood sugar. So this was a huge shock for me. And I'm a doctor (laughs) and I had no idea (laughs) that, you know, kind of under the hood, all of this chaos was going on where, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just a problem of glucose. It's what that does downstream. It creates so much inflammation, chronic inflammation, which accelerates the aging process. It ages your blood vessels faster than you want. It sets you up for a greater risk of Alzheimer's disease. So there's so many issues at play here if your glucose is not where you want it to be. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is a great setup for uh, connecting high blood glucose levels with some of the impacts or some of the chronic diseases that are so prevalent in in our society and, and really discussing some of the mechanisms there. Because as you say, um, if your uh, glucose doesn't have a VIP laminate to get backstage um, into your 
uh, into your cell and eventually into your mitochondria for the production of ATP, then there is a buildup of glucose in your bloodstream. And when there's too much glucose in your bloodstream, there's only a few places or a few things that can happen. So sometimes it gets stored, a little bit of it gets stored as glycogen in your liver for a rainy day when, um, when you need energy and you're, and you're not eating for some reason. But can you also uh, outline where glucose ends up when it builds up to chronically high levels in, in serum? Well, there's a lot of problems with the buildup of glucose. And let me first just take a quick step back to say that this is a problem both of insulin and glucose. So when we think about the bouncer in the club analogy, what happens initially is that insulin starts to change in response to more issues with your metabolic function. And insulin can change, in some cases, some of the research that we have, up to 13 years before you see a change in your glucose. Hmm. So if you think back to when I was 35, so that was 20 years ago, I had this elevated glucose, but I also had an elevated insulin. Right. And there was probably a period of time, maybe 10 to 15 years, where my insulin was working harder and harder and harder to try to keep my glucose down. And then I got into a failure state where it just couldn't do that anymore. Yeah, that is key because this is not just a conversation for people in their 50s. This is a conversation for people in their 30s. Totally. 20s. Because 20s. Because so many of these diseases that are concomitant with high blood glucose are progressive. Like you just don't see them for a long time. They're crawling along, That's limping right. away. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they become symptomatic. But for years, they can just present as, oh, fatigue or, you know, brain a little bit of brain fog, et cetera. Um, so when you become, uh, you know, insulin resistant, um, and you do build up the this kind of chronically high blood sugar, um, you, you know, really, there's only a few avenues there at that juncture. So, it, glucose can then be converted to triglycerides or stored as adipose tissue. Uh, um, for where I noticed it, for me, to be honest was, uh, I, I think you might categorize me as the apple type, and there's various metabolic types that I know that you talk about in your book and, um, and in your other work, uh, but I was putting it on in the middle. So sort of visceral belly fat, definitely like muffin tops, um, you know, carrying, you know, maybe an extra 15 pounds kind of around the middle. Now, that might be different, for women, and, and maybe you can address that. But the other thing is that when uh, the other kind of storage, or I would say um, end product for too much glucose are what are called ages, these advanced glycation end products, which can be so damaging and cause inflammation to your cardiovascular system and can kind of be the upstream cause of a lot of cardiovascular complications. Is that right? That's exactly right. So I would put these symptoms and conditions into two different categories. So one category is some of those early signs and symptoms of glucose not working properly for you. So you described increased belly fat. That is a really common phenomenon once you become insulin resistant. And it's not just a problem of vanity where maybe it's harder to buckle your genes. It's, it's really a metabolic crisis because visceral fat is not, you know, just something that you have to look at. It is metabolically active. It is metabolically dysfunctional. And it's adding to this, I think of it as this fraternity party gone wrong. It's adding mm. to the problem. Mm. So having more fat in your viscera, so fat around your waist is really harmful for you as you get older. So one of the one of the signs of metabolic health is that you've got minimal visceral fat, that your waist to hip ratio, as an example, is healthy. 
So waist to hip ratio measured at the belly button for women should be 0.85 or less. For men, it should be 0.9 or less. Men are a little straighter, not quite as hippy. And I would put the belly fat into the same category as another thing you mentioned, which is low energy. Hmm. So when you're not able to convert the food that you're eating into proper fuel, if you're not what's known as metabolically flexible, and maybe we could define that together. If you're not metabolically flexible, you are going to find that you have an energy crisis, that you just don't have the energy you once did. You may feel, you know, like I did in my 30s, like I was getting old before my time. You may feel like, um, you know, by five o'clock, all you can think about is that glass of Carbonet, 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 (laughs) Cabernet. Cabernet. (laughs) Right. Carbonated Cabernet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what we drink in Northern California. Yeah, and I completely understand. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's this energy crisis. There are also mood changes. So there's mm-hmm. problems with depression associated with issues with glucose. So there's all of these things that are happening. And I would say for most patients... When they go to their doctor with some of these symptoms, they're not getting their metabolism checked. And then there's the more chronic diseases. So you mentioned cardiovascular disease. It's the number one killer of men and women. We know that men are actually doing better in terms of morbidity, mortality, you know, rate of death with cardiovascular disease. Women are not. Hmm. They're actually doing worse. So nine of the top 10 killers of people are related to metabolism. It's really important to realize that. And part of what's going on is that insulin resistance is creating that fraternity party in your blood vessels. So your blood vessels are getting damaged. Even for women, when their glucoses are fasting glucose in the pre-diabetes range. So it's not that you have to wait until diabetes to start to see some of this damage. You can see early atherosclerosis, some hardening of the arteries that are really important in the body. You can see that in pre-diabetics. So it's important to realize that so many of the chronic diseases that we're dying of have as a root cause insulin resistance. It almost sets up, you know, the way of thinking of cardiovascular disease now is that it's like an autoimmune reaction where you're attacking your own blood vessels and causing damage. And the root of it is insulin resistance. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, you know, your vascular system wants to be this kind of glassy um, set of pathways, kind of, I always think about it as like the hockey rink when the Zamboni (laughs) like goes over the... (laughs) And, and and you can release the puck right, <laughs> right at one side of the rink, and once and when the zamboni has just done its job, the puck will kind of slide very seamlessly across you know the the ice rink. But when the ice rink after the game or after the the, the, the hockey game is all pocked up um, with skate marks, and you drop that same puck, well, it's just not going to move. And in fact, sometimes I think about that. This is a little bit of a homely. Uh, metaphor, but I think of that little that hockey puck as as LDL because these low density lipoproteins, especially like the small little nuggets, um, you know, if your vascular system is inflamed, if it's pocked up like that ice rink, there is more chance that that LDL is going to get lodged in the arterial wall, oxidize, form plaques, and 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 send you down this kind of cascade towards atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So you said something that was just kind of astounding. Nine out of the 10 top killers are related to metabolic dysfunction. So I can think of cardiovascular disease and then stroke is obviously very related to that, more or less the same condition. I'm thinking maybe fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. What are some of the other ones? Alzheimer's disease. Right. So that's a big one that I think we should talk about because- I think a lot of folks think of Alzheimer's disease as this condition that you get when you're old, so 65 or older. But it is a disease of middle age. The changes that happen in your brain, and I would say insulin resistance is fundamental, Mm 
The changes that happen in your brain occur about 25 years before a diagnosis. So the time that you want to intervene is really in your 30s, in your 40s. It's a problem of middle age, and that's when we have to address it. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I've read a statistic that in America anyways, the last 16 years of people's lives are riddled with at least one chronic disease and often two. And so even though we might be maintaining a life expectancy of maybe 78, although that's gone down over the last few years, even pre-COVID, that's gone down. And then COVID really accelerated it, particularly in in some demographics. Um, But our health span has been going down for decades now, right? That's exactly right. I mean, one of the problems is that Mainstream medicine does not define health. Mainstream medicine is centered around disease. So if you ask a physician, how do you define health? They're going to say it's the absence of disease. Right. And that is a non-answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we really have to metricize what is health and well-being? How do you define it? Because your dashboard, you were talking about like a car dashboard earlier, and I think we've got we've got a need to really create our own dashboards so that we've got our health span, that period of time that you feel fantastic, relatively free of chronic disease, you want to lengthen your health span as long as possible. But your why, your why might be different than my why. So we really need to craft that particular piece. I also think that I have a great grandmother Hmm. who died at age 97. And she died in her sleep taking no medication. She had a little glaucoma drop, but that was about it. She lived a really long, rich life. She outlived four husbands. <laughs> and she was kind of a, she was kind of a rascible. Yeah. So she, she was a squeaky wheel. You know, she would travel to our house with suitcases of kale and wheat berry cookies. You know, she wasn't like the typical great grandmother that shows up with Barbies and um, sees candy. <laughs> so that's really what I want. She had a really yeah. long health span. And she even came to my wedding a year before she died and flirted shamelessly with every man in the house. And that's really what I want. I want to be able to go to my great grandchildren's weddings. I want to have that health span to last as long as possible. And, um, you know, another statistic that you're reminding me of is that right now by age 65, Americans on average are taking four prescription medications. And this has increased dramatically since about 30 years ago when it used to be two medications. And so that's just one measure of how we've got this increasing rate of chronic disease and the usual knee-jerk reaction is to serve up a pharmaceutical. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then some of these pharmaceuticals precipitate these trophic cascades. So what I'm thinking about particularly is statins, for example, that are prescribed, potentially over-prescribed for cardiovascular disease. They essentially shut down the endogenous creation of LDL. Um, and we villainized LDL um, in this caper of, of heart disease. But there are your body wouldn't make LDL unless it was useful for some other purposes. So can you talk about some of those other purposes? And then also the antecedent of of um, like testosterone, for example, is cholesterol. That's right. So when I'm watching, uh, well, I don't really watch the news, but um, but when I have watched TV in the pla- in the past, sometimes I will see a pharmaceutical uh, commercial for like a statin, like Lipitor, I think is one, and then Viagra 
is the next one. Right. And I'm like, well, you prescribed this thing <laughs> that stopped the production of endogenous cholesterol, and now we can't make testosterone, so our sex drive plummeted, and now I'm going to try to sell you Viagra too. Um, so I don't know if that's me just kind of living in a somewhat imaginary world, but, um, but maybe you can just kind of pull a little bit uh, on that. Well, hormones are really the portal that I started with in my career. It's something that I pay a lot of attention to in both men and women. And what we know is that if you look at the sex hormones that your body makes, so that's the testosterone that you mentioned, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, all of these hormones are made from cholesterol. I had this experience when I was in medical school where I did anatomy my first year. And I was just so horrified by this experience with the cadaver, you know, cutting through muscle, cutting through bone, that I went 100% plant-based. And I went from having a total cholesterol of about 170, 180, down to a total cholesterol of about 120. Hmm. And what I found was that my hormones declined dramatically. So I wasn't eating as much fat. It was 100% plant-based. This was a little bit after the Dean Ornish era, where we were eating a lot of pasta and not much fat, like 10% of calories from fat. And I really suffered. So my mood suffered. I don't think I was making enough estrogen to support my mood. My testosterone was lower. I didn't have a lot of opportunity for sex, but my sex drive was not what it used to be. I don't believe that, <laughs> but that's another podcast. That's, a, that's, that's the rated R prog- okay, podcast. Sure. But I, you know, I then looked later at some of the literature on total cholesterol and that usually tracks with LDL. And we know that for brain health, you know, 70% of the brain is fat. We know for brain health that you really need a threshold of total cholesterol around somewhere in the 130 to 140 range. Mm. So when you shut down the production of cholesterol, when you shut down the production of LDL, you can have these downstream problems such as lower levels of sex hormones. Right. So I want to bridge into the conversation around hormones, um, but... Before we do, for anyone who's at home who wants some very simple self-administered tests, if they happen to be listening to this podcast right now, and they're asking themselves, oh, geez, am I metabolically dysfunctional? What are some of the simple self-administered tests that people can, can apply to themselves to gauge their metabolic health? Great question. So I would say first is that waist to hip ratio. Mm -hmm. So that's a free way to see if you have this apple shape where you're increasing your waist compared to your hip size. So that's one. Another is you could get a glucometer. So it only costs about $25 to get one of those little devices where you prick your finger. It's known as flash glucose monitoring. And so you could check your fasting glucose. You could check your glucose one hour after eating and see if you're within the optimal range, which is not the same as the normal range. (laughs) So we want the optimal range. So for fasting glucose, for instance, I like to see it between 65 and 85 milligrams per deciliter. Above that, you're starting to develop insulin resistance. So another technique would be to see how you do with fasting. So when I first started doing intermittent fasting, I was like climbing the walls come 14 hours. I was just feeling like, when is my next meal? (laughs) And the problem was I wasn't metabolically flexible. Mm -hmm. So the idea with metabolic flexibility is that you're able to burn carbs, burn glucose as you get it in your diet, but you can also flip a switch kind of like a hybrid car to burning fat as an alternative fuel source. I did not have good metabolic flexibility. It was very hard for me to fast. At that time, I was having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks in between. And I was about 25 pounds heavier than I am now. So another one is fat mass. So you know what should happen if you care about health span? You want to keep your fat mass relatively stable over the years. The tendency after age 40 is that you gain about five pounds of fat, and you lose about five pounds of muscle every decade. Mm. 
unless you're doing something active about it. So measuring your body composition is another way of assessing your metabolic health. There's so many other ways. I mean, there's blood testing that we've talked about. Do you have some favorite ways? Well, since I read your book, I was like, hmm, I wonder what my BMI actually is. And I know BMI is a little bit controversial because every individual is slightly different. So you could have greater bone mass and that might, or you could be shorter or whatever. So it's not maybe a perfect measurement, but would you categorize BMI as a decent metric? And if so, how, how do you measure it? So body mass index is your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So that's how you calculate body mass index. You can go online and use a calculator to get it pretty easily. I did the long math. <laughs> you it did was the very long math. difficult. <laughs> and I did it in um, in pounds and, and centimeters. So you had to convert. I had to, well, yeah. Well, actually, I multiplied times 703 or whatever at the end. <laughs> so I was like, and then I had to, and then I was like, do you square? Do you square it before you do the subtract? Anyways, yeah. Yeah. But um, I think I came out uh, at 19.22222 forever. Yes. Um, but that would not have been the case a year ago. Right. And I really attribute that to, honestly, well, a number of different things. One the continuous glucose monitor, because I really basically got to hone in on the things that were spiking me and then just adopt very basic protocols around the things that didn't spike me, basically. That's right. Um, it was not brain surgery, honestly. It was just, here's your here's your dashboard. Here's your data. What are you going to do? Um, and then I, I really just stopped drinking for about a year. Um, and I've heard you talk about alcohol as just pure sugar. Um, or liquid sugar, essentially. Um, so that was very helpful for me. Um, and then, uh, and then the last thing was, I, I, you know, I adopted an intermittent fasting protocol on, you know, sixteen eight, um, basically consolidating all of my consumption into an eight eight hour window, mostly between eleven and seven, but not neurotic orthorexic <laughs> right. about it. You know, I'll push the edges of it. You know, I'll, I'll receive alms. You know, if my if my daughter makes me some, you know, chia pudding at you know eight o'clock or something, um, but it completely flipped the switch, and I didn't really have a word for it until now, which is I think it's I am metabolically flexible now. Yes, so you're uh, like a hybrid car now. <laughs> yes, yes, and that's what we want. So mm -hmm. our DNA developed with this alternative fuel source and with this ability to flip back and forth between glucose burning and fat burning. And if you're someone who's just constantly burning glucose, that's all you do, you're not gonna have as much flexibility when you fast or when you have a period of what is known as metabolic rest. Hmm. So our DNA really design, is designed to accommodate metabolic rest. Now you asked before about body mass index Right. And what we want with body mass index is roughly for it to be somewhere between about 18 and 24.9. That's considered normal. 25 to 30 is considered overweight. Above 30 is considered obese. So those are rough guidelines. I can also tell you from taking care of professional athletes who are just all muscle, they have, you know, maybe 6% fat or less. They often have body mass index that is right at the 25 range. Right. So it's important to realize that you have to take that into consideration. You need to consider the context. But I would say overall, your weight and your body mass index are probably the worst indicators of metabolic health. You need a little more dynamic data. So that's why I like the continuous glucose monitor so much. I do research looking at the use of CGMs in non-diabetics. And it really tells us that people that have prediabetes that are not diagnosed when they see their doctor once a year can be diagnosed more easily with the density of the data from CGMs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about optimal diets that can address glucose. And maybe we can just start with classic keto um, and you can help to unpack the ketogenic diet 
its downstream mechanisms and potentially um, dispel the myth that it's just eating bacon all day. <laughs> <laughs> bacon all day. Yeah. Rosé all day, bacon all day. All day. <laughs> So the classic ketogenic diet was developed about 100 years ago. It was developed initially for epilepsy. And what was found was that usually children with epilepsy, when they went on a ketogenic diet, and I'll define that in just a moment, many of them stopped having seizures. In fact, there are super responders, probably related to genetic variation, who can use a ketogenic diet and even get off of their seizure medication. So I'm not recommending that to anyone who's listening who's on seizure medication, but it's pretty amazing to me that with the 30 minutes of nutrition I had at Harvard Medical School, (laughs) that here's this dietary intervention that can put you in remission with a seizure disorder. So that's pretty stunning. Yeah. And since then, it's been used for other neurological conditions, including Alzheimer's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, It's being used more and more as a tool in psychiatry, which I'm really excited about. So I think it's important to realize that classic keto was the bacon all day. So generally, the the classic keto diet was um, high fat, a lot of saturated fat together with very low carb. So usually 20 grams total of carbohydrates per day, and then a moderate amount of protein. Because in some people, if you eat too much protein, that can then get converted into glucose and lead to insulin resistance. So that's classic keto. I'm not a big fan of classic keto because since 100 years ago, we've really developed our understanding of the microbiome. We understand, you know, if you just take a moment and think about your glucose an hour after you eat postprandial glucose, we know that the number one factor that determines your postprandial glucose is your microbiome. Mm. So do you have those benevolent microbes that are uh, working on the fiber that you're consuming and the lunch that you just had? Or do you have those more Homer Simpson type of bacteria (laughs) that are leading to inflammation? They're extracting a lot of extra energy from the food that you're eating and then storing it as fat. So the microbiome is so important. When you eat classic keto, you're not really feeding the microbiome. Okay. That's a great point. So microbiome, we've talked a lot about the microbiome on this show. It's essentially this community of 39 trillion or so bacteria and archaea and fungi that live in your gut um, that upregulate and or regulate so many different mechanisms within the body. Um, but metabolism is certainly one of them and immune system and on and on. Um, but those bacteria in your gut, mostly clustered uh, in your gut, are consuming or fermenting fiber, right? And when they do that, they're producing metabolites or postbiotics, these short chain fatty acids like butyrate, propionate, and acetate. These that can really uh, upregulate your your metabolism. Um, so, and fiber also plays this role of decelerating the absorption of glucose in your small intestine. So. I'm not sure I completely understand the mechanism, so maybe you can help me, but it's sort of uh, at least the soluble fiber forms almost this kind of lattice work in your small intestine and essentially just slows down the absorption of glucose so you don't see these big spikes. Is that a fairly decent understanding? I think that's a perfect description. You know, I, I think that most Americans do not get enough fiber. Yeah. So the average is somewhere around 14 grams a day. We're meant to be getting around 30 to 50 grams per day. We know that our paleo ancestors consumed about 50 to 100 grams of fiber per day. Hmm. So definitely it helps to slow down the absorption of glucose so that you don't get that steep slope, the spikiness that causes so much inflammation in the body when your glucose spikes way up and then crashes. And fiber is a carb, right? And we're demon and keto generally <laughs> demonizes carbs. So we have to kind of think, as you say, in a more nuanced way here. So you have a metric uh, 
in your book and, and in your other work called net carbs. Um, and can you describe what, what net carbs are and then perhaps put that into a broader picture of macronutrient ratios? When I first went on a ketogenic diet about uh, seven years ago, I did it with my husband because we do a lot of N of one experiments. Yeah. And he did fabulously. He lost about 20 pounds, mostly at his waist. He had mental acuity from all the ketones he was producing. He was just like, oh, you know, like he was <laughs> hearing the angels sing. Yeah. And I was in the corner. Maybe I lost one or two pounds. And I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> that is patently unfair. It right is there. so unfair. <laughs> That's called the testosterone advantage. Mm. But I think it's important to realize that we all have these individual responses to interventions like a ketogenic diet. And for me, I was eating too much saturated fat. I was not feeding my microbiome. And I was told at the time that if you want to follow a classic ketogenic diet, you've got to get less than 20 grams per day of total carbs. You know, your protein has to be within this range, moderate right. amount of protein, maybe 20% of your calories from uh, protein sources, 10% from carbs, the rest from fat. And you were kind of left to your own devices about where that fat would come from. So I was enjoying the grass-fed steak. I was, I had some bacon. Yeah. And I had so much inflammation in my body, just wasn't working. So that's when the NF1 experiment gets a little more interesting because mm -hmm. I figure if I have to personalize it, then there's a pro probably a lot of other people that have to personalize it too. So then I started trying to use net carbs. I was told don't use net carbs when you go on keto, but that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I'm not going to eat bacon all day. So I started to use net carbs. The way it's defined is that you take the total carbohydrates from something that you're eating. Maybe you have half an avocado. And so that might have seven grams of carbohydrates. You then deduct from the seven grams of carbs the amount of fiber. So say that avocado has four grams of fiber. So seven minus four is three. It's three net carbs. So net carbs reduce the amount of fiber. And what I found was that when you focus on net carbs and you really make sure that you're getting those prebiotic nutrients that you need to produce the short chain fatty acids, I think it really makes a difference in terms of your response to a ketogenic diet. Hmm. So the ratios between the primary macronutrients, so carbs, protein, fat, where should that be more or less? It, considering the net carbs equation that, that you just laid out. So what I found is that you can play with the percentage of carbohydrates. So I was taught, you know, 10, 20, 70 in yeah. terms of the macronutrients, as I just described. But what I would say is 20% of your calories from carbohydrates, tracking your net carbs, keeping that around 25 net carbs per day or less, together with the same amount of protein. So moderate amount of protein, I think somewhere around 20% is reasonable. And then the rest of your fat from ideally plant-based sources. So you can okay. have some saturated fat, but I think the more that you lead with whole foods as a source of fat, so avocados, olives, coconuts, you know, making sure that your oils are from really good sources, extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil is what I cook with. That really makes a difference in terms of what I think of as clean keto. Mm, yeah. Clean keto. I think that's more or less what I'm doing un unwittingly um, <laughs> because I don't eat a lot of animal fat, but I will. I'll eat omega-3 rich fatty fish, for example, like lime caught, very precious, but not that much. Um, and, uh, and then mostly getting my fats from, from vegetable sources. Like, honestly, I probably can overeat avocados, um, especially since I read your book. I was like, oh, boy, am I overeating <laughs> avocados? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but again, I don't want to get too neurotic about it. Um, but as far as it pertains to this kind of saturated fat versus unsaturated fat, what should people be thinking about there? 
There's some debate about this. So you're now asking me a question that is um, <laughs> part of my love language, which yeah. is how do you personalize this? Mm -hmm. So I have patients who process saturated fat impeccably. Yeah. So they can eat saturated fat. I recommend from you know really healthy sources, sustainable sources, grass-fed, grass-finished, um, wild meat like bison and elk, caribou. So there are a lot of people who can eat saturated fat and do well with it. I'm someone who's got the genetics that do not respond well to saturated fat. I become more insulin resistant in response to eating saturated fat, which is probably the reason when I tried a ketogenic diet seven years ago with my husband, that he did so well and I barely mm. had any progress. Right. So this is bio-individuality, right? It's bio-individuality, but it's also, you know, we use that term a lot. And I think it's important to realize that this is part of your dashboard. Yeah. So my wish is that people understand more about their genetic blueprint because it affects so many of the challenges that you experience as you get older. So I have a lot of genes that relate to my issues with glucose. I have genetics that um, put me at a greater risk of uh, breast cancer and colon cancer. Mm. And when you know about that genetic blueprint, when you know about the genes that are related to how you process saturated fat, it can really empower you to find the, the matching diet for you. Right. So were you did. I assume we've taken some DNA tests then. I have. Yeah. And so it's sort of this combination of underlying, uh, understanding your underlying fixed nucleotide sequences in your DNA, your blueprints, and then also uh, these other metrics, these dashboard metrics. That's right. Um, and being able to analyze that such that you make the best decisions for yourself. That's right. So I, I say that it's part of the dashboard, and I mean that quite seriously. So you can have your genetics as part of your dashboard, and then you can have the biomarkers that maybe you're working on with N of 1 experiments. So one of my biomarkers is hemoglobin A1C. I optimized it three years ago, so I don't track it so much anymore. But I still track with my continuous glucose monitor, my mean glucose and my standard deviation, also known as variability, kind of how spiky you are. So I track those along with my metabolic score. Those are important on my dashboard. And then I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease. So I'm especially motivated to reduce my risk of insulin resistance. And I want to track my cognitive performance as I get older. So that's also on my dashboard. Yeah. So the target of the Gottfried Protocol or this modified keto and the target of intermittent fasting is ketosis, yes. right? Yes. And so can you explain what is ketosis? Ketosis is that you're using an alternative fuel. So when you're burning the carbs that you consume, the glucose that you consume, that's one fuel source. And for men and women, women in particular, we use glucose metabolism almost exclusively until we hit 40. And after age 40, things change. We go through this metabolic crisis where you just don't use glucose the way that you once did. I think that there's also something interesting here because we hear a lot about insulin as the kingpin hormone, but insulin also has a counterpart peptide hormone called glucagon. And I, I often find that so many of these hormones, it's kind of the yin and the yang, like leptin has ghrelin and you know, glucagon has insulin, et cetera. And so can you kind of explain, I, I suppose, like when the body doesn't have glucose or stored glycogen, what's going on? How does it go from burning that to burning something else? So what happens when you restrict carbohydrates or you fast is that you run out of glucose to burn as fuel. Right. So you burn through the glycogen, your glycogen stores don't get you very far. And so your body switches like a hybrid car from burning glucose to burning fat. So most of us have pretty extensive fat stores. Women have more fat stores than men. My professional athletes have less in the way of fat stores. We actually have to watch it carefully for them. 
But when you make that switch from burning carbs to burning fat, that's when you start to produce ketones. So ketones are really interesting. They are a fuel source, an alternative fuel source that your body is designed to make on demand. It's really your backup fuel source. And you can use it as a preferential source of fuel, which I think is especially important for women over the age of 40. Mm. So many women go through this metabolic crisis. They hit 40 or 45. They notice that they've got more brain fog and they just can't remember that word on the tip of their tongue. They're noticing this change in executive functioning. And they don't realize that their glucose metabolism is slowing down and they may not be metabolically flexible enough to hit that, flip that switch mm -hmm. from burning glucose to burning, uh, to using ketones as fuel and burning fat. So it's a really important biochemical process. You can get there also with fasting. So you can get there in one of two ways. You can either eat a ketogenic diet so that you're low in carbohydrates. You run out of carbs to use as fuel. So you start burning fat or you can fast. And this is another place where men have an advantage. So women generally take about 18 hours to start producing ketones when they're fasting overnight, like with intermittent fasting, whereas men tend to take only 14 hours to start to produce ketones. Mm. So this is another situation where intermittent fasting tends to favor men, at least when they first start. As women become more metabolically flexible, they tend to catch up. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, one of the techniques that I found to be incredibly effective for myself was adopting essentially this, this ketogenic, modified ketogenic diet in a uh, combination with internet, with uh, <laughs> internet fasting too, actually. <laughs> that'll Highly keep recommended. Your, that'll keep your cortisol levels That's down. Right. <laughs> uh, but intermittent fasting in combination with some cold hydrotherapy. So, and just to kind of play this out a tiny bit, um, so I would be in a fasted state, I'd wake up in the morning, I might have some just black coffee, maybe with some MCT oil, we can talk about medium chain triglycerides. And then I would take sometimes take a sauna, but always take a cold shower in a fasted state. And I was essentially almost quasi hypoglycemic at that point. And then so much energy is needed for thermogenesis to essentially get my body temperature back up where it belongs that my mitochondria had to like burn something and there's no glucose around. So it basically just goes into my, sto my fat storage and converts these triglycerides into free fatty acids and I assume some ketones. And all of a sudden, I mean, I just saw just almost could almost witness the fat burning off of me, which was just kind of... Wow, but you know, once you understand the mechanism, that actually makes total sense, right? Well, you described it so beautifully because cold thermogenesis is a form of hormesis. Right. All of us need hormesis. We need these good stressors that activate some of these benevolent pathways that we have in the body, as you just described with your mitochondria. So you have this delightful experience of really changing your metabolic rate, changing your metabolic flexibility and noticing the visceral fat start to fall away. And that's what we want. I mean, that's a pretty simple solution to this metabolic crisis that we're facing. And yet it's not something that you're going to hear about from most mainstream physicians. Yeah. And it doesn't really cost anything. It's free. <laughs> Fasting and cold water. <laughs> <laughs> um you know, this is not just something for the, you know, the affluent or the, the effete necessarily. You know, this is available to anyone that wants to apply the protocols to themselves. Um, so I want to also talk about how hormones play into all of this. And one thing that I really took a lot away from your book were, were two different things, two different particular hormones that I hadn't paid as much attention to. One was... Um, like IGF-1 or human growth hormone, um, and the relationship between growth hormone and insulin. Um, because a lot of these hormones, they're, like you say in the book, and like we've talked about with basketball, they're, it's part of a team chemistry, or they're playing in the same symphony orchestra. So can you talk a little bit about the role of growth hormone and its relationship to other hormones? 
Growth hormone is really important. I would say overall it's a more secondary hormone. So I would say mm -hmm. cortisol and insulin are probably the two most important um, I sometimes call it Michael Cortisol Leone because it's <laughs> so important in the body. It, it's involved in blood sugar regulation. It's involved, of course, in your response to stress, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. It's also involved in immune modulation. So cortisol is so essential. So is insulin. And then there's these other hormones, things like the reproductive hormones that you don't really need to survive. You need insulin and you need cortisol to survive. Hmm. But estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those are really not quite as important. Growth hormone, I would say, is essential as you're a kid. So when you're growing, it's related to your height. And it does what you might imagine it, it would do. It's involved in growth and repair of your tissues in your body. So women actually make a little more growth hormone than men until menopause. And at menopause, we've got a significant reduction in growth hormone. And that's yet another piece of the puzzle when it comes to the metabolic crisis that women especially are experiencing. Mm -hmm. So I think growth hormone is really important. I remember I first started paying attention to it when I was in Hong Kong with a friend and he was telling me about this um, Sprint 8. And it was kind of an early version of doing interval training where you go all out for about 75 seconds and then you recover at a moderate pace either on equipment or with weights for say a minute and a half or two minutes and you do a total of eight of these rounds and he said this raises your growth hormone so i hear that and i think really i'm not mm -hmm. so sure so i measured my igf1 which is an easier way to assess. It's a proxy for growth hormone. I measured my IGF-1. I did this sprint eight for about eight weeks and I increased my IGF-1 by about 50%. Hmm. Pre pretty significant increase. And the thing about growth hormone IGF-1 is that you wanna, like many things in physiology, you don't want it to be too low and you don't want it to be too high. So you yeah. want to find that middle path that really works for you in terms of these levels. Yeah. Another, I think, interesting component of, of your book um, or illuminating component of your book was testosterone and the prevalence of testosterone in women. Because generally, we don't think of androgens as associated with with women, we think about men and sex drive and masculinity and hypertrophy and all of these things with testosterone. But can you describe women's specific relationship with testosterone? Testosterone is the most abundant hormone in the female body. So it's true that men have more, they've got about 10 times more than women do, but it is essential for our functioning. So what we know is that it's involved, yes, in sex drive, in muscle hypertrophy, in, you know, for women, I think of that more as a response to the exercise that you're doing, not necessarily bulking up. It's involved in some of the anatomy of women. So the vulva, the clitoris, they have androgen receptors, and mm -hmm. you want to keep stimulating those in terms of keeping the, uh, the business open. And testosterone's also involved in something a little more subtle, which is confidence and agency. Hmm. So really stepping into your power as a woman, I think testosterone is a big part of that. There was an interesting study looking at MBA students, and they found that for women, the women who had higher levels of testosterone had more risk-taking behavior, not negative risk, but positive risk-taking behavior. The women with much lower levels of testosterone did not take as many risks. These are mostly financial risks, but that's important you know, for those who are on a business career. Hmm. So I think this role of agency and confidence is so important. And testosterone is one of the interesting ones because it can start to change in your 20s for both men and women. So if you eat a lot of sugar, if you have a lot of refined carbohydrates, and or you have a lot of perceived stress, high perceived stress, high cortisol load, that can accelerate the decline of testosterone. And I really see it in women. So we talked a little bit earlier about how uh, cholesterol is 
um, or how testosterone is synthesized from cholesterol. Are there particular foods that you would suggest eating as a woman if you want to maintain certain testosterone levels? Well, I just mentioned that refined carbohydrates are the enemy, so you want to avoid those. Yeah. And there's even been studies looking at things like bread and pasta associated with lower testosterone levels. Hmm. So testosterone, just like any other hormone, you want to be in the middle path. You don't want too little. You also don't want too much, which is an issue for women. So for women, the higher levels of testosterone are associated with a syndrome known as um, polycystic ovary syndrome. Right. And that's actually very similar to low testosterone in men in terms of the metabolic dysfunction that you see. Mm. So the two extremes are not good for women. In terms of foods that help, we know that lean protein is a really great source. Whey protein is a really good source. I always give whey protein to my professional athletes because it really helps to maintain testosterone. It's also good for growth hormone. Like in the form of like a smoothie or Like a in shake a shake. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, another factor that's important is that when you eat out at restaurants, and we don't know exactly why this is, is it that you're eating hidden carbohydrates? Are you getting industrial oils that you're exposed to? But there's something really inflammatory about eating out. Yeah. The more that you eat out, the more that you get DoorDash or, you know, food delivered, the lower your testosterone so that's another important factor, too, and it relates to your risk of diabetes and blood sugar dysregulation. Hmm. But I love eating out. <laughs> I know, I do, too. <laughs> Actually, what I really love is not having to clean after I, I eat. Know. It's such a luxury. I know. Uh, especially with all my children who never help out. Um, but you, I still too. I still you love too? them. Yeah. I still love them. They want to get paid for like just cleaning their dishes. I'm like, what the... They're entrepreneurs, yeah, Jeff. I guess so. How about leptin and <laughs> ghrelin? So I, I never knew much about these these particular hormones. Um, so can you describe the functions of these kind of sister hormones, how they are made, how we become intolerant to them, and, and why they're important? I think of leptin as being a cousin to insulin. So leptin is the hunger hormone. It's the hormone that tells you to, to put the fork down. Ghrelin, as you described before, is a counter-regulatory hormone. So it's the one that tells you to pick up a fork. And what I see in my patients, I started looking at leptin levels together with insulin levels maybe 15 years ago. And I saw that for a lot of my patients who had metabolic dysfunction, who had insulin resistance, that they also had leptin resistance. Mm -hmm. So they had this elevated leptin level, and it was associated with more fat storage. Yeah. A lot of the same techniques that you use to become more insulin sensitive, such as consuming more fiber, eating, um, I'm a big fan of eating almost a pound of vegetables a day, half cooked, half raw. Uh, getting sufficient fats, like the omega-3s that you mentioned, from fish, from smash fish. Um, What's smash fish, real quick? Smash. So salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. I Boom. always forget the sardines. <laughs> I know. On I know. purpose, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just block them out. Still looking for a good sardine. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, some of these things that are insulin sensitizers also can help you with becoming less leptin resistant. There was a physician maybe um, 15 years ago, Ron Rosiel, who wrote quite a bit about leptin and the leptin diet. I would say focusing on insulin is probably a way to address leptin too. Um, one of the ways, if we take a step back, one of the ways to think about this is you've got this adipostat in the brain. And it's this kind of complex feedback process that takes the food that you consume and also the energy that you burn, like with exercise and your daily activities, and it determines how strong to make your appetite. Hmm. And what happens for a lot of women, this is once again a situation where women are at a disadvantage, what happens after age 40, especially in perimenopause when estrogen begins to decline, is that appetite increases. So some of that is related to a decline in estrogen, mm -hmm. 
because estrogen is an appetite suppressant. But you can also see problems with insulin because insulin and estrogen have this uh, tango that they're in. And you can also see problems with leptin and ghrelin. Is there any place where women have an advantage? Yes, I'm I so hear glad about you that. asked. <laughs> well, we actually have stronger immune systems. Mm. So that's often an advantage in that we respond to an infection usually much more robustly than men do. So, you know, at least initially in the pandemic, women were not dying of COVID the way that men were. Right. But it also can backfire because you can have a dysregulated immune response. It can lead to more vaccine reactions and reactions to boosters. It can also lead to more autoimmune disease. Right. Yeah, I just interviewed a woman named uh, Dr. Terry Walls. Yes, know of her. course. And so I had to learn a lot about multiple sclerosis. And um, I was reading some, t- some statistics about MS and then about autoimmune diseases in general. And I could not believe the the prevalence of these diseases specifically among women. It was That's like right. seven it was MS, I think it was like 75 or 80 percent. Don't hold me to that. I could be wrong, but it was some disproportionate amount. I was like, oh my God. But I guess that has to do with having an immune system that is potentially more functional, more protective against toxins and pathogens. That's part of it. The other part is that there's this incredibly dynamic period called perimenopause where women go from having this adaptive immune response, which is how you react to uh, vaccines, that becomes much more dysregulated and more intense. So on top of this difference, this sex difference, where women have higher rates of autoimmunity, more immune dysregulation, we also have this change that occurs in perimenopause. And that's why you see a lot of women develop MS or type 1 diabetes for the first time in perimenopause and menopause. Yeah. But there's a few other advantages. We have longer telomeres. We tend to live longer. So for 2020, the life expectancy for a woman in the U.S. was about 80 and about 74 for men. 74? Yeah. Six years difference? Yeah. Whoa. That's the 2020 data that I have at my fingertips. There's also a difference in cancer. So men have a lifetime risk of cancer of one in two. So one Mm. in two men develop cancer. For women, it's one in three. Mm. We also have a difference in terms of what's known as the jogging female heart. Have you heard about that before? No. So we have these organ reserves that are different than men, probably in preparation for reproduction. So during the menstrual cycle, for instance, our cardiac output, the amount of blood that's being put out by our heart, can increase up to 20% just over the course of the menstrual cycle. So we've got this dynamic range that's a little bit bigger than what you see with men. And then in pregnancy, cardiac output can increase even more than that. Hmm. So we talked about the impact of diet or when and how we eat on um, on chronic disease. Um, I want to explore in the time that we have remaining um, the mind-body connection and how psychology impacts physiology. And I know that you're starting to, I mean, this has been a, a topic that you've excavated for some time, but I know as you move over the next couple of years, you're really going deep on this. But I, I wonder if you could connect the dots between trauma-inducing events, uh, neglect, abuse, that cause sort of acute trauma, and then just kind of quotidian stress, and how that impacts our physiology and potentially um, disease. This is such a fascinating topic, and I feel like we are in an era of rebranding trauma, understanding trauma in a totally different way, and also coming up with some novel solutions for how to address it and resolve it, which is so exciting to me. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to trauma, you know, the if we go to the literature first, what does the science say? We've got this robust data from 1998. 
where there was a study done at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego called the ACE study, where they looked at adverse childhood experiences. And the study was so fascinating. They did it together with the Center for Disease Control. And they found that people who had adverse childhood experiences, so neglect, parents who got divorced, uh, maltreatment, sexual abuse, physical abuse, witnessing a parent that was, uh, that there, you know, there was domestic violence. When you have an A score that's one or higher, that puts you at greater risk of certain chronic diseases in middle age. Hmm. And that was really the first study to connect physical manifestations with adverse childhood experiences. So from there, we've built, I would say, a body of evidence showing that there are certainly mental health effects of trauma. So if you just look at ACEs, for instance, there's a greater risk of depression, suicide, addiction. So there's a number of mental health effects related to trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is uh, twice as prevalent in women compared to men. Hmm. So there's the ACE data, and then there's the non-psychological effects. So this is where I'm really fascinated. I'm always curious about the interface between mental and physical health. In some ways, I feel like it's a false dichotomy. Right. And what I see with so many of my patients is that they, they struggle with their cortisol levels. You know, one of the a typical uh, battery of tests that I run on my patients is to do genetics especially pro athletes, because about 40% of your performance and injury risk and recovery is related to genetics. I look at nutritional testing. So I'm looking at micronutrients in my patients. I'm looking at the balance of fatty acids. So omega threes, sixes, and nines. I'm looking at hormones, of course. So cortisol, cortisol awakening response, diurnal cortisol, metabolized cortisol, I'm looking at sex hormones besides cortisol, so estrogen, progesterone, testosterone in men and women. And I'm also looking at gut function. So stool testing, looking at um, permeability of the, uh, the gut lining. And what we know is that there are a lot of people who are running around dysregulated. Okay. So not just with mental health concerns, although those are important and part of the legacy of trauma, but we know, for instance, that this metabolic crisis that we're in, some of it can be traced back to trauma. Mm -hmm. So there is a really clear association between ACE score, childhood trauma, and your risk of diabetes later or hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. We know that um, even episodic trauma, you know, not during childhood, but later, I feel like at this point, most of us have experienced significant trauma and it becomes very dysregulating. So some of that is the interaction of the trauma in your environment with your genetics. There's also epigenetic effects like what you inherited from your ancestors. But when it comes to dysregulation, the way I think of it is the pine system. So pine is mnemonic, mnemonic for mm -hmm. the psycho-immuno-neuroendocrine system. So the pine system is what gets dysregulated with trauma. And depending on, I think, your genetics and your environment and the role of epigenetics, for some people that might show up as abnormalities on their continuous glucose monitoring and their metabolic health. For other people, it might go down more the path of immune dysregulation and a greater risk of autoimmune disease, which has been traced back to high A scores. In other people, it might be more neurological effects. Mm. So... We've got all of these different physical sequela of trauma. And this is another place where I think there's a gap in mainstream medicine, where most clinicians are not taking an ACE questionnaire from their patients. They're not thinking about childhood trauma and how that's showing up in the room when they're seeing patients with the abnormal glucose or the cortisol that is all over the place. So when I think about my patients, you know, the most common uh, downstream results I see are definitely the metabolic dysfunction and also problems with the control system for your hormones. So the way that your brain talks to your adrenal glands, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but you can broaden that a little bit further, which is what we do in functional medicine. 
So I think of the control system as the hypothalamic pituitary, adrenal, gonadal, mm. so ovaries in the women uh, mm-hmm. and men testicles, yes. and then the thyroid and the gut are also involved. So a lot of people don't think about their gut, their gut as being involved in their hormone balance, but it certainly is. Mm. And your thyroid is also playing a role here. Yeah, of course, we tend to silo all of these things, right? With their very specific cubbyhole expertise. And I think what you're trying to do and what functional medicine tries to do in general is a systems biology approach. Look at the whole system. It's quantum, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, because I think, uh, um, uh, like, for example, you know, 90% of your serotonin, so a particular neurotransmitter, chemical messenger that regulates mood, gives you that feeling of calm and warmth, is created in your gut. And it's created by certain, um, in, in some cases, certain bacteria, streptococcus and enterococcus, and that can be connected to diet. So... Serotonin is synthesized from tryptophan, for example, and B6. So, you know, and so you can have depression and, you know, you go visit your doctor and he's just going to write you a script for an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, that essentially inhibits the reuptake of of serotonin into a neuron or something. So it keeps it into your system and it keeps you happier and, and feeling more calm and serene. And that can be helpful sometimes for stabilizing somebody, but never really or rarely really addresses the root cause. Um, So then you start to kind of pull that apart a little bit and say like, okay, well, am I eating properly for my for my cognitive function and for my mental state? Um, Am I doing some of the other things um, in my life or the the various protocols that I can adopt um, for uh, for my mood. Like, for example, am I eating enough prebiotic fiber to support the bacteria that might be making the serotonin? So once you start to, you know, think about these things as holistic systems, there's a lot more agency, I find. You know, you're not just getting an SSRI and saying, okay, I hope this works. That's right. I mean, you just described the gut-brain axis, I think, very beautifully. It's this bi-directional communication between the gut and the brain, and it's the part that often gets the gut gets left off of the psychiatric conversations. And we know from the STAR-D trial looking at antidepressants that at best, you get about a 30% treatment response. So certainly there are people who find selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to be life-saving, but the problem is they're used so widely. So yeah. one in four women over the age of 40 is taking an antidepressant. One in four. One in four? Which is just appalling to me because we're not thinking of root cause. We're not yeah. starting first with food, with the way that you eat, move, think, feel, and supplement, connect. We're not thinking about the function of the gut. We're not thinking of trauma and how that could be leading to depression, suicide, and some of these novel solutions that are finally coming back our way that can really help you with the resolution of trauma. Yeah. Well, I am so excited to um, follow your work on trauma particularly um, because there's been a lot of socio, like socio-psychological um, you know, work around trauma. Um, actually, Gabor Mate is coming to Topanga in a couple of weeks. Um, and he's been, you know, preeminent on, on this topic. But I think where you're coming from is so interesting of trying to actually understand some of the physiological mechanisms, like what's going on here? Is trauma kind of, you know, methylating genes such that they produce this protein or don't produce that protein, you know, really getting into some of the mechanism there. And I'm just, I can't wait to see what you, what you come with. <laughs> on oh, that front. thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I want to be mindful of your time because I know that you're you're flying back to the Bay Area as much I w- as I want to uh, keep you hostage uh, in Topanga. But um, perhaps you'll come back and, uh, and absolutely we can continue <laughs> continue this dialogue. And and I just want to um, express my gratitude for the way that you express yourself. Mm-hmm. Obviously, 
your work speaks for itself. Um, you're incredibly thorough and rigorous and diligent with everything that you do. Um, but you are walking this tightrope between um, not selling people short, pulling people up to have very intellectual or uh, um, kind of deep dive conversations, but also making the information accessible to people in a way that, that they don't feel excluded from the conversation and that they have actionable ways to apply that information to their own life. And I just think you, because of the way you express yourself, you give people a lot of agency. So thank you for that. I so appreciate that. You know, Jeff, I, I feel like we've got to change the conversation in this country, in this world that we're having about metabolic health. We have to change the conversation we're having about hormones for both men and women, but especially women that are facing this crisis out over the age of 40. And I so appreciate the way that you are helping us change the conversation. Thank you for that. Thanks. Well, I have a wife and three daughters. <laughs> So Back it's to either, the estrogen footprint. It's my estrogen footprint. <laughs> so either I need to fully embrace and understand um, what's happening there, or buy a shotgun and move to a cabin far away. <laughs> and I, and the latter is just simply not an option for yeah. me. So, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune Podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.